Okay. Well, hello everybody, and welcome back to an Astro Coffee, our Astro Coffee Hangout for, I guess this is our last one, for September. My name is Tony Darnell, I run DeepAstronomy.Space, but you guys know that, and every week, or every week we have hangouts on this time on Thursdays, uh, about a variety of topics, and today we have got, uh, we have got a curator of, of astronomy here uh, for the uh, American Museum of Natural History to talk about a NOVA, which is a very uh, unique kind of, it's not unique, they happen all the time, but they are an interesting uh, sort of eruption that happens in the uh, universe that was, I guess, observed 600 years ago and now has been reobserved uh, and rediscovered uh, recently. And we're going to talk about those observations here today. Now, I'm a little bit late today. I, am, I hope that the... Audio is coming through loud and clear. There was some audio issues I had. I don't know if it's because Mac OS up, updated. I just, I don't even know. But but the, please let me know in the chat boxes if uh, you are not hearing me okay. And if you're not, I'm going to like freak out because it was, it was working right before I hit the start broadcast button. Uh, which reminds me, we are broadcasting on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitch and on Periscope. So I'm monitoring three of the four of those. I'm not really monitoring Twitter because I can't get all of that up at once, but I am monitoring YouTube, which is where most of you are. And I see John Suffles back and a lot of other people, Peter Quinn's there. And I thought I saw Galaxia there. There she is. Galaxia is, is, um, uh, is back too. After a while, it's good to see you back. Uh, uh, and the, so the chat is going pretty good and we hope you guys will leave questions and comments for our, um, our guest. Carol normally pops in right about this time and I have her, uh, describe the hangouts and things like that, but she's currently on travel in Australia and probably on a plane right now. And, uh, uh, she said she tried to call in, but she may not be able to, uh, so that, so Carol probably won't make it today, but she will be back the next time. So thank you guys, uh, for, um, for, uh, you know, your patience on that. She'll like I said, she'll be back. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about today's hangout. Let me pull up my guests in some ways. It's a lot, um, it's a lot easier. It's just the two of us talking today. So I have to do a lot fewer button presses, but my, my guest today is, um, is, uh, oops, is Dr. Michael Shara. He is a curator of astrophysics at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, hi, Michael, and welcome to the hangout. How are you doing? I'm great and delighted to be here with you. Uh, good. It's good to have you too. So let's dive into the, um, oh, before I get going, let me just mention that I have to mention that these hangouts are, let me pull this up, are sponsored uh, by the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society. You can see their logos here in the lower banner down there. They make this possible. They're the ones who put, who uh, they, they, they provide uh, a an avenue for their members to talk about their research with the general public through, in part, these hangouts. So I want to thank them for their uh, both endorsement and support uh, in making these hangouts. Okay, Mike. Um, I, I, I suppose you like. You, I think you prefer calling being me calling you Michael, correct? No, that's that's fine. You, oh, do you get okay? Good. Well, uh, so for, uh, let's start with our viewers um, and talk about what a nova is first, uh, and and you know how it's not like a supernova or anything like that. So give us a little idea of what a nova is. Sure, uh, a nova is a, a new star, apparently something that appears in the sky that hasn't been seen before. That's the Latin word for new. And novae, we know now, are all binary stars. Single star doesn't become a nova. The sun, for example, will never become a nova. And those binary stars always include one white dwarf star. There's a stellar corpse, an object about the size of the Earth, and, of course, about the mass of the sun, so a million times denser uh, than uh, lead, uh, that is accreting hydrogen from its companion. Most of the time, the companion is just an ordinary run-of-the-mill red dwarf star, something like the sun or maybe a little bit less massive. Occasionally, it's a red giant star. But as far as we're concerned, it's just a source of hydrogen that gets accreted onto the white dwarf star. And when you accrete about a Pacific Ocean's worth of hydrogen, about one mile of hydrogen, onto the surface of a 
10,000 mile diameter white dwarf, that hydrogen becomes unstable uh, in the nuclear sense. It starts to fuse faster and faster and faster. You get a thermonuclear runaway, a kind of titanic hydrogen bomb, and it brightens the white dwarf star up to almost a million times the brightness of the sun. And that lasts for a few weeks or months until the accreted envelope of hydrogen is blown away. And then the white dwarf uh, starts to uh, get fainter and fainter. And after a few weeks or months, uh, the nova essentially uh, is gone. Of course, the binary star is still there. This doesn't result in the destruction of the white dwarf. It's just a, a haircut as far as the white dwarf is concerned. Uh, but the nova becomes much fainter than it was before. And so in pre-telescopic societies, you'd see one of these new guys appear every 10 or 20 years in the sky, brighten up, become some of the brightest stars in the sky. And then after, as I said, a few weeks, few months, disappear and never be seen again. Could these, uh, were they bright enough to be seen during the day? Uh, only the very brightest of them. Okay. Uh, you need a nova to be about as close as the closest known such binary system to have any chance at all of seeing it during the day. So most of the time it's an evening thing. You see it in the night sky. That's right. Okay. Uh, supernovas get bright enough. You know, they're... 10,000 times or a million times brighter than novas, so you can see them during the day, even when they're thousands of light years away. Novas aren't quite that bright. Okay, well, um, so if I remember my astrophysics right from school, I didn't, uh, mm. aren't these a, so the, it's, it's a very specific set of conditions. Condition is we've got to have a white dwarf. You've got, well, first of all, you've got to have a binary star. One of those has to be a white dwarf. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's got to be close enough to draw material off of that companion star. And the companion star, as you said, can be anything from a red dwarf to a red giant, but mm -hmm. probably a red dwarf, just maybe because there's more of those. Is that right? right. There's just more exactly. red dwarfs? Yeah. So, but isn't it when they, so they're drawing all this hydrogen off of the companion star. Isn't it sort of a calibrated process? There's a known, at, because white dwarf stars are a very specific size, Right? Mm -hmm. All white dwarf stars are more or less the same size, aren't they? No, you you can have white dwarfs uh, that can undergo this process that are as low in mass as about half the mass of the sun, right up to the very maximum mass of a white dwarf possible, which is about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. And you would think, well, just a factor of three change in mass can actually result in almost a factor of 100 in change in the radius. Uh, the most oh, massive so dwarfs are tiny little things. Uh, they're only about the size of Ireland, uh, whereas the most uh, the least massive white dwarfs uh, can be several times bigger than the Earth. Wow, okay. that I just learned something. I thought that they were more or less the same size because of their... Aren't they electron, electron degenerate, or am I thinking of neutron stars? No, no, you're absolutely right. They're all electron degenerate. Which means uh, that, they only, that they, they're so closely packed together, you mm -hmm. can't push them together anymore. Well, you can't push the atoms together. That's what, right, that's what I mean. The, rather, the nuclei. The atoms, in fact, inside a white dwarf are pressed so closely together that the electrons have been torn free. So think of this as a gas of free electrons that floats free inside the white dwarf, and it's the electrons that provide the pressure, not the ions, that keep the star from collapsing. Okay. All right. Well, where I was going with this was I thought that novas were more or less the same brightness, but is that, that not true? No, there's a range in brightness. Okay. All right. Then I'm wrong. Okay. Yep, yep. The least bright ones and the very brightest differ by a factor of 100 in luminosity. Okay. All right. So these are these are explosions. They are they happen, and when the gas coming off of the companion gets to a, a combustion point, whatever that happens to be for the system, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they explode and last several weeks. There, there. How would it compare uh, to uh, to the to the death explosions of stars that we always hear about, like supernovae? Well, right. The supernovae. So the supernovae typically uh, get oh, ten thousand, even a hundred thousand times brighter. Uh, than uh, typical nova does, uh, and it will last longer. Okay. That's what's got to be very important in this story. Uh, you will see them 
for months, typically, uh, maybe even a year or two, and they decline in or they decline in brightness much more slowly, mostly because of the radioactive decays that are going on in the ejecta from the supernovae. The same sort of nucleosynthesis and radioactive isotopes are not produced in novae. So novae can decline either very slowly or very, very quickly. And when they decline very, very quickly, you know that you've got a nova. It cannot possibly be a supernova. That turns out to be a critical clue in the work that we're going to talk about. Okay, all right. Uh, well, uh, before we move to that, I can, Philip W. is asking a question. Um, about the scale of Nova uh, from dwarf to hyper. I think he means uh, from the di depending on the kinds of stars that is the, are the companion, do the, does that affect the brightness of the Nova? Absolutely. So the, uh, there are things in the astronomical literature and classes of objects called dwarf Novae, which we're also going to talk about, uh, Novae, Kilonovae, uh, Supernovae, and Hypernovae. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and they're, um, the dwarf novae and the classical novae, or the novae, are one in the same system. At least that's something that's been postulated for many years now. And one of the fun things about this paper that we're talking about today uh, is that it shows that a many-century-old nova does revert to being a dwarf nova, uh, after several centuries or multiple centuries, something that had been suspected for a long time. This is another piece of evidence in favor of that. Is so that because it's just eating up the car, the other star? Uh, it is, but in the process of eating, it's also burping, if you will. Uh, <laughs> the eating process... How rude. Is, isn't sorry about that. That's just the way <laughs> it is. Uh, when you eat hydrogen uh, from one star and you feed it onto the second star the hydrogen accumulates in a disc, a kind of ring around the collar, around the white dwarf. And then every few months or every few years, you get an instability in the disc, what we call a thermal instability, and the material in the disc cra all of a sudden crashes down onto the white dwarf star, releasing quite a bit of energy, brightening the star up to, oh, maybe 10 times the brightness of the sun from its previous 100th or 110th the brightness of the sun. Those are dwarf nova outbursts, but they're what we call accretion events. It's the gravitational energy of the stuff in the ring that falls onto the white dwarf that brightens the dwarf nova. The classical nova is a nuclear event, so thermonuclear runaway, it's a bomb. Supernovae, uh, which are the deaths of stars, can occur because a white dwarf exceeds the critical limit at which electron degeneracy can support the white dwarf, and the entire white dwarf will fall down, will collapse to become a neutron star in a matter of a second or a few seconds. Uh, and of course, you can also have a supernova in a single star, uh, not in a binary, where it's a very massive star, more than, say, oh, 10 or 20 times the mass of the sun, where the core of the star fuses itself all the way from hydrogen and helium up to iron, and you run out of support. It's as if you take a house and smash the pillars that support the house out, the entire house will collapse. The same thing happens in a massive star. We call these things core collapse supernovae, where the inner part of the star implodes, might end up as a black hole, and blows off the outer half or two thirds of the star. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, the, okay. So we hey, I just wanted to tell you I'm on, but I'm I in saw the airport. I was going to call this you. Is Carol, oh, yeah. Um, and I'll probably have to ring off. Sorry. Okay. Well, Hi, we. I, I will tell you this. Your connection is great. It's uh, it's loud and clear. So, can you hear us? Okay. Well, that's good to know since the whole airline um connection system collapsed last night but anyway carry on i was listening in <laughs> okay folks well like i said carol's on her way back from australia which i i hope when she gets back she'll tell us a little bit about the meeting because a lot of cool stuff happened uh, at least that i read in the news so absolutely yeah that'd be great okay carol good well if you have a question for mike just let, let us know and uh um you can just chime in anytime uh it's good to know you're there though okay so uh let's talk about your paper let's you know why don't you give us an intro into this Nova that was apparently observed 600 years ago and now is being re-examined. Why don't you give us a little bit of background on that? Sure. Um, for more than 30 years, I and friends, colleagues 
have been hunting for this object uh, because it is by far the best localized classical nova of antiquity. By antiquity, I mean before the invention of the telescope. Uh, so on the night of the 11th of March, 1437, in Seoul, what is today Seoul, Korea, or just outside of the city, uh, the imperial astrologers who watched the sky every single night of the year and wrote down in great detail what they saw, every meteor, every aurora, uh, of course, every comet or supernova, noted that a new star had appeared inside one of their asterisms or one of their constellations, which of course are different from the constellations we use today. And inside the asterism called Wei, W-E-I, between the second and the third stars of Wei, they noted the presence of a new star which disappeared after 14 days. 14 days is much too fast for a supernova and Wei is the constellation or the group of stars we today refer to as the tail of the scorpion or Scorpius. So if we look, if we search carefully between the second and the third star of uh, Scorpius, or what we think uh, are the stars that correspond between Way and Scorpius, we should find an old nova. We should find a binary star that is uh, today looking like what a nova should look like uh, 580 years later. And uh, we've been hunting for a long time. The clues that astronomers use to find old novae are that when we look at novae one or two or almost three centuries after eruption, they're still very hot. The white dwarfs have blown off their envelopes, but they remain up at 20, 25,000 degrees. So they're very, very blue. So we're looking for objects that are brighter in blue images, blue filtered images than in yellow or red filtered images. And uh, in particular, Mike Bode and I took the advice of Richard Stevenson, one of the world's foremost historians of astronomy, and spent a great deal of time and effort looking between two particular stars, Mu and Zeta Scorpii, uh, for such blue objects. And over the course of 25 years, we looked at many thousands of stars in much detail, and we came up absolutely empty-handed. It was a totally futile, I won't say waste of time, <laughs> but a frustrating experience. And finally, I guess about 10 years ago, we both at about, at about the same time called it a day. We, I mean, of course, we all both been working on many other things at the same time, publishing other things, but we both decided to put this one on the back burner. And I, I was moving stuff around in my office about 18 months ago when I came across the file, uh, read through it one more time very, very quickly and went, you know, in the last 10 years, tools and techniques in astronomy have advanced light years, enormous amounts. We have online catalogs, online search engines, the ability to look for things that even five or seven years ago would have been tough and 10 years ago impossible. So I decided to take this position uh, between these two stars and broaden it. You know, let's, let's, what if we look twice as far out, three times as far out, can we find anything? And in a grand total of 90 seconds, um, I found the Nova of 1437. Uh, it was really one of those, oh my God, kinds of moments uh, where, you know, if I had only had these capabilities 10 years ago, it, it all would have fallen. So you went on one of the, the online archives then? That is correct. Which one? I, um, several. Uh, perhaps the one that helped the most uh, was uh, Strasbourg, the um, Centre de Données Stellaire. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Uh, and I went and plugged in the position where I thought it might be, but used a much larger search radius. And sure enough, uh, a couple of cataclysmic binaries popped out. But I knew one of them uh, because that cataclysmic binary was sitting inside a shell of gas, uh, which is in the planetary nebula catalogs. And I had seen that planetary nebula 25 years before on some of the ultraviolet and visual photographic plates that I had taken when I started this search, but I had ignored it because it wasn't between the right two stars. But now here was a cataclysmic variable sitting inside, but not at the center of that planetary nebula. And so the 
authors who found that cataclysmic variable, which was an X-ray source, basically ignored it. They thought it was just a line of sight coincidence. And I knew in my heart of hearts that it was no coincidence at all that that cataclysmic variable uh, was, in fact, I was dead sure of this already, the Nova 1437. Uh, And so I started accumulating all the evidence or all the data that I had on it. uh, And I immediately contacted colleagues in Chile and South Africa and asked them to start observing it intensively. On the second night that we started observing it, taking pictures of it, um, one of my colleagues in Chile noted that it went into a deep eclipse. Uh, That already was exciting because it meant that we could determine the orbital period very accuracy and probably eventually get the masses of the two stars and many of the other physical characteristics. Because the great uncertainty in all binaries is, what's the tip angle? What's Mm -hmm. the inclination angle with which we're seeing the binary? The sine I problem, as it's called in astronomy. But that's gone. We know what the inclination is. It has to be an edge-on system. Otherwise, we wouldn't see eclipses. And so the greatest unknown in all binaries was just, automatically removed uh, from us. (laughs) The other beautiful thing was uh, that the star that we saw there was not in the center of the shell, which is why everyone had ignored it before. And I realized, hey, wait a second, this thing got pretty bright. It must have been at least as bright as one of the stars in the Big Dipper, Uh, could have been as bright as Vega, might have been zeroth magnitude, but no fainter than second magnitude. And the reason that's true is because it was seen in Seoul, which is at plus 40 degrees uh, north latitude, and the star is at minus uh, minus 40 degrees um, declination. So the star, even if it got to the highest point in the sky in Seoul, couldn't have been more than five, six, seven degrees above the horizon. It had to be bright in order to have been seen. That meant that the system is close. So it really has to be close by And when it's close by, it can have a larger proper motion across the sky. When you hold your finger up in front of your nose, blink your eyes, you see the parallax effect. Mm -hmm. Your finger appears to jump back and forth relative to the much more distant background wall or or scenery that you're up against. Similarly, a star that's really close to us appears to move across the sky faster than a star that's much further away. And I realized that if the reason that this cataclysmic binary isn't at the center of the shell is because of its proper motion, then we actually have a new kind of clock. We can prove utterly independently that this cataclysmic variable and this shell of gas are one and the same, that the shell must have been ejected from this object, and we can independently check the eruption date of 1437. How do you do that? Well, what you need is you need images taken as long ago in the past as possible, ideally in 1437, but of course we don't have that luxury. There were no cameras. They were just working out the detectors then, I think. That's it. Yeah, 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 exactly. The the (laughs) eye was the only detector. (laughs) That was it. (laughs) Um, but those guys did a great job. They wrote it all down and they gave us the, they gave us the data we needed. In fact, mm-hmm. if I'd had the names of those, those astrologers, I'd have included at least put them on the paper, right? <laughs> as a investigator on the paper for sure. Um, so we were able to look back in time and we found clear images of this star in the Harvard plate stacks. There's a century plus worth half a million photographic plates that are stored um, at Harvard and which are now being digitized and put online by great good luck. The hundreds of plates that cover the area of the sky where this star is were online, digitized and online. And we could pull up a particularly beautiful plate from 1923, compare it with our image from 2016, overlay the two images and all the stars on the two images overlap perfectly. Just very, they, they don't move. Their proper motion is essentially zero because they're all so far away except for this cataclysmic variable. And we see a very distinct motion. Well, that was really fun because 
we can now see where it's moved in the last 100 years, see where it was 100 years ago, we can then extrapolate to where it was 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 years ago, and bingo, 600 or 580 years ago, it was smack dab in the center of this shell of gas. Now, we, hold on, hang on. This proper motion that you're, that you're measuring, this is just the motion of the star in the galaxy. That is correct. As, as it floats through the okay, good. As it as it zips through the galaxy or Milky Way galaxy, it's it's moving along, and because it's relatively close, only a few hundred light years away, it appears to be moving much faster than all the much more distant background stars. Okay, you've just answered a question Alexander Rangers was asking in the chat about how far away it is. So it's a couple of hundred light years, you said. Or about right. 100. Right. And now uh, an equally legitimate question is, well, why doesn't the shell just keep on moving with the star? And the answer is, imagine, you know, by analogy, imagine that you're... Oh, so wait a minute. The shell was not following along in these other plates? No. The shell is, okay. the shell is dead steady. It's stopped. Okay. okay. And the reason is very simple. Uh, imagine you're in your Cadillac, zip, your Cadillac convertible. You're zipping down okay. the highway. Take a handful of confetti and throw it up in the air. What happens to the confetti? Well, in a very short period of time, the confetti comes to a stop and settles to the ground and doesn't move anymore. And that's because the confetti is susceptible to the air that's streaming by. The ejecta from a nova, ex in exact analogy, are susceptible to the interstellar gas that's sitting out there and runs into that interstellar medium, the interstellar gas, and gets stopped, slowed down and stopped, on a time scale of less than a century, or 150 years perhaps, but the star is so much more dense than the interstellar medium that it, the binary star just keeps on plowing through the galaxy. And so where the shell is and where the center of the shell is, is pretty much where the explosion happened because that ejecta get stopped by the interstellar medium very, very quickly. Okay, I'm trying to visualize to make sure I've got this system in my head properly. There is a cataclysmic variable. Yes. Which you're calling a cataclysmic variable mm -hmm. that it was you saw in a cloud or in a, in a, in a shell of material. Off-center. Off-center. Off but center. somewhere in, but you weren't looking at the white dwarf, were you? You were looking at the companion star. Well, we actually see the light today mostly of the companion star. Okay, so when and, you said earlier that it was in eclipse yeah. and that that was really great um, and fortunate, um, mm -hmm. how did you know, what were you seeing in eclipse exactly? Ah, so what we're seeing is that there is a white dwarf with an accretion disk around it that is in orbit around a second star. Most of the light And the white dwarf and the ring and the disc go behind the subgiant every 12 and a half hours, the system gets much dimmer, about three times dimmer than it normally is. Okay. So I think, okay, I think I've got a good picture now in my head of what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, lots of questions here. Uh, Michael, Philip W. was asking, would the archive from Harvard that Michael is talking about uh, be the same catalog that Cecilia Payne and her team worked on? Uh, the same plates, many of the same photographic plates, though, of course, uh, Cecilia Payne worked uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, while these plates were being accumulated and naturally none of them were digitized, so every plate that she and all of the other many computers, the ladies who worked at Harvard, used, these were all individual analog plates and they painstakingly had to extract the data from each and every one my colleagues and i were able to take hundreds of them and plot up the brightness of this star over uh half a century in a matter of seconds uh, because we have the great power of the digitized archive available to us today 
I want to get back to this idea of these archives because I think in the future they're gonna they're gonna revolutionize astronomy in ways we never even imagined. But uh, but I want, but, I'll, but before we leave to go on that topic, let me just uh, uh, let me get to a couple of questions here. David Corvin on YouTube is asking, uh, could a nova become a larger supernova? In essence, whatever minimized the explosion uh, mm-hmm. changed and then explodes again, and this time larger. Is that so? It's an excellent question. It's an open research question. Uh, Astronomers are reasonably convinced, we're collectively convinced, we have been for about, most of us for 10 years, people who work on novas, that some novas can give rise to supernovas. The way you do that is you have to take a white dwarf and make its mass increase all the way up to the Chandrasekhar limit, the 1.4 solar masses, at which point electron degeneracy fails and the white dwarf implodes. How do you do that? It turns out that in most nova explosions, you actually eject not only all the matter that you've accreted since the last explosion, but even a little bit of the white dwarf too. And so in the vast majority of cases, the white dwarf mass goes down. But if you accrete the hydrogen fast enough, You can actually, instead of building up this cold, degenerate, highly explosive layer, you can build up uh, or you can start burning the hydrogen quiescently rather than explosively and build up a layer that grows and grows and grows. Uh, will undergo what we call helium explosions, which will slow the process down. But you can still, in some cases, if you're accreting fast enough, push the white dwarf past the Chandrasekhar limit. So the answer is yes. For the very most massive white dwarfs, which have grown because of high accretion rates, you can, at least in principle, make make, um, supernova explosions. We have one good candidate today. In the Andromeda galaxy, we see a nova that goes off not every 10,000 or 100,000 years, as most classical novae do, but it goes off every single year. And that's because it's within about one or two percent of the Chandrasekhar mass, it must have grown from being a less massive white dwarf. It will go off as a supernova sometime in the next half million years in the Andromeda galaxy. Great. Okay. Very good question. Okay. So um, let's see. Um, I'm going to make sure. Um, see, uh, Philip W. is commenting. Thank you, Michael, for helping preserving pain and company work and making sure discoveries can continue to be made in the future. Uh, so yes, thank you. Um, the, the archive at Harvard is, uh, as you said, Tony, an absolutely priceless resource. Uh, it is not entirely digitized. Yes, that process is ongoing. Uh, every year there's a larger and larger data release. Uh, and to people who are interested in what's happened to stars over the last century, uh, puzzling over stellar evolution. Uh, This is an absolute and total gold mine. Yes, it is. And and John Suffel is asking, is it available to anyone? Can anybody, is it, it, can, is it something the general public can use or not? I believe the answer is yes. I, I'm not aware of any restrictions that are placed on the public. Uh, Yeah. When I was, when I was getting started in, I started my career in, in solar physics and we were trying to make something called the virtual solar observatory, which would take all these solar data and turn it into a virtual observatory and of course there was a night sky count, uh, analog to that called the virtual observatory i don't think that particular idea panned out well but this idea of certain specific archives uh, have been quite successful notably the ones that you're talking about plus there's a mast archive for uh, space telescopes which has a lot of the hubble data as well as spitzer and and pan stars and other data sets right. all and put in beautifully and easily accessible available and downloadable yeah uh, these the idea that you can suddenly have hundreds of thousands or millions of images available to you and just as important at least in the harvard archives and and i think increasingly so now in all other archives not just the image itself but the brightness of every star in every image and the ability to click on a star or enter the coordinates of a star and take those hundreds or thousands of entries and plot up a light curve over months, years, or century or a century uh, is, is a tool that astronomers even 20 years ago would have just given their left arm for, and, and now it's just available to all of us. It's yeah, and the real, the real developments. Carol, oh, go ahead, Carol. I was, 
I was going to jump back. I jump back in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have something now at Hubble called the Hubble um, Source Catalog, and it does exactly what Mike says. Of course, Hubble hasn't covered the whole sky because the field of view is very, very small. But for every source that has been observed by Hubble, now we do have that catalog, and there's an initial catalog, and then they're constantly making improvements. But as he said, you can map things over time, and especially if you're interested in anything that changes a lot, um, that's that's the place to go. And Carol, how's the Hubble Source Catalog different from MAST? What's the difference? MAST, by the way, oh, is this Mikulki Archive for Space Telescopes, which is a, right. a data set that includes lots of instruments. So, so MAST itself is a collection of something like 13 missions, including Hubble. It will include the James Webb Telescope. Um, and it has all of the data that has been taken. Um, the observers who like Mike himself, um, who specify the observation, they get uh, a year um, in the future, it may be six months, but right now it's a year, to analyze the data, publish their data, and comb through it. And then it's released through the public archive, MASS. The source catalog is um, the data itself has been calibrated carefully. Um, it has been combed through by algorithms that find the sources and then measure them. And it's not just brightness. Uh, it's also morphological parameters, like how extended is it, what shape is it, that kind of thing. Um, and also gives you all the error statistics and then the, 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 the measurements in each color and then the total um, magnitude. So, so it's a it's, super... And then you can map it over. So it's, it's really every source, but it's not... It's every source that the algorithm can find. But that doesn't mean that people don't want to go and look at the imagery themselves and comb through it. But then also remember that mass, <clears throat> excuse me, contains spectroscopy too. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So uh, this, yeah, this idea, and I, and I want to spend just a little bit of time on it because it is so important. I think that these uh, these archives are as with, with telescopes like James Webb coming up and... Uh, 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 LSST and so many, you know, we've already had the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. All of these things are just going to be, there's no way a person is going to be able to look at all of these images anymore. So to be able to ask questions, scientific questions of just the entire night's, you know, imagine data sets where the entire night sky is imaged every cup twice, three times a week. That's what LSST is going to do. You need to be able to learn how to ask questions to that data set and get answers. And that's what, and, and in a sense, that's what Mike has done uh, with this particular thing. He was looking for a specific object, asked the proper question, asked the question right, and he by basically expanding his radius and going, aha, here is an object that could have been uh, the same thing from 600 years ago, and you were able to plot the proper motions based on how many years of observations again were you well to, to get the proper motion was actually pretty straightforward um but you needed didn't you need data from the from past decades absolutely and, yeah. and the best image it turned out was 1923 we looked at images from about 1900 or 1910 onwards in most cases the star was too faint we couldn't see it uh, there were many different telescopes many different photographic plates uh, sometimes the sky was cloudy sometimes the moon was too bright etc etc but by being able to very quickly step plate by plate by plate by plate through the archives, uh, after just a you know an hour or so, we found oh there it is in 1923. That's the oldest really good plate, uh, and so we were able to save many weeks of effort. Normally, it would have taken several weeks to go through all these plates. Instead, we were able to do it in maybe an hour or two, sift through all of them to find the very best one, and then we also were able to ask. The one question uh, that was in many ways the sharpest point of this paper, and that is what sort of behavior, what sort of cataclysmic binary behavior is it exhibiting 600 years or 580 years after the explosion? And the answer is it is now exhibiting dwarf nova eruptions. And that then ties together old novas with dwarf novas. The vast majority of old novas, that is the binary stars that make novas, in the 10, 20, 50, or even 100 years after their eruption, do not behave like dwarf novas. They are rather bright. Mass transfer rate remains rather high. The accretion disks are stable. There's no dwarf nova behavior. 
Uh, so I and some colleagues postulated more than 30 years ago that they all become, or virtually all become dwarf novas multiple centuries, three to 500 years after the eruption. But it takes quite a while for the white dwarf to cool and for the mass transfer rate in the binary to go down. The only way we could really test this is by finding systems that really were novas more than 300 years ago. And this is the very first object we have where there's a clock, the proper motion clock attached to it, which with the shell proves that it is the old nova. It's the binary that gave rise to the shell, to the nova shell. And the Harvard plates show, that, show us that today or 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it was already behaving as a dwarf nova. And so two separate classes of objects, the nova-like binaries, the bright uh, post-nova binary systems, and the fainter dwarf nova systems are really the same thing. They're metamorphic states of the same thing. They're butterf butterflies and caterpillars just seen at different states of development. So if you could look at the novas now and the nova state and follow them for a few hundred years, you would, okay. your, your, your hypothesis is that this would, we would see them turning into dwarf novas after some, some number of centuries. Yep. Well, are there any other candidates besides this one that you can test this on to get more, to get more statistics on? Are there any other 300 plus year old nova Novi. Yes. <laughs> that the you... answer is we already have three. There are okay. three that are published, two by my myself and my colleagues, uh, one by some South African colleagues, where we see dwarf novas inside old nova shells. The first one was the dwarf nova Zcam, which is the prototype of you know one sort of type of dwarf nova. Uh, in 2006, 2007, with the wonderful satellite Galax, which unfortunately has since been deactivated, we found a gigantic shell, 30 times bigger than any previous nova shell. Uh, and this is probably the nova of 77 BC. There's a reasonably good uh, record, even back to 77 BC. 77, wow. BC from Chinese astronomers, yeah. um, which said there was a star in the very far north, not far from the pole star, not far from Polaris, uh, which went off. And that's where Camelopardalis is. Uh, so we had a reasonably good case, even in 2007, for a nova shell with a dwarf nova near the center. And we have two more. Uh, one was um, one is A.T. Cancri, which probably exploded in the 1600s. Uh, and then there's yet one more in the southern hemisphere found by Brent Mazolsky and his colleagues at the South African Astronomical Observatory. But there's no firm date. There was no way of tying how old these systems were to their nova shells. The shells themselves don't give us an age because they're pretty much stationary. The systems are a little too far away to get good proper motions. Uh, there was, they weren't particularly far or not at all off center from the shells. So we didn't have an independent clock. And you could argue, you know, maybe these things are 300 years old, 500 years old, 5,000. We just don't know. So we don't know how long it takes for an old nova to become a dwarf nova. In this case, the real novelty here is that we have that proper motion clock, which not only lets us determine the year in which the nova happened, but actually the night on which it happened. So we know to within a day what the age of this system is. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess it's so unlikely you'll get another example like that that's that oh, clean, isn't it? Oh, no, no, you know, given given what we know now, okay, g given that, that we know better what to look for, um, you know, as in Monty Python, I'm not dead yet. There's, <laughs> there, there, there are others, and if they're there, um, we're going to find them. I know, but you need to start, it seems to me, with old observations that are that are several hundred years old, and those are going to be in a form you've presumably already gone through. You know already, don't you, of the ancient ones? Well, this was, this was again, the best, uh, but it's not the only one. There are a handful, you know, of order four or five, six more, uh, where we think we have a fighting chance. And especially now that we know better what to look for, uh, I think that we're going to find at least one more, and that'll be really nice. There is an, another thing that 
another prediction that was made as part of this idea 30 plus years ago uh, in the so-called hibernation scenario of cataclysmic binaries. And that is that some of these binaries not only get fainter, the mass transfer rate doesn't just go down, but it actually goes down to essentially zero. It turns off. And that's why we called it hibernation. In fact, I really should have called it in retrospect suspended animation, where the mass transfer rate goes down to nothing. Uh, and then in that case, what you'll see is a binary white dwarf and a red dwarf where there is no mass transfer, but that binary is still at the center of an old Nova shell. I haven't found one yet. Well, what uh, would turn it off? I mean, you've got a, a white dwarf orbiting a, a star. I mean, gravity, right? You don't just turn it off. Well, here's here's the argument. Here's the nineteen the argument from the nineteen eighty six hibernation paper. Every time you have a nova, you blow off from the binary system about one part in a hundred thousand or one part in ten thousand of the total mass of the system. That's the stuff you blow away. Sure. And so the gravitational pull between the two stars goes down by one part in ten thousand. Oh, and it pushing it apart. And the stars then separate by about one part in ten thousand. And that's enough. So, and that's enough because huh. what's, what happens is the white dwarf has its hands around the throat of the red dwarf. <laughs> okay? But if you relax that grip by one part in 10,000, it's the difference between choking and expelling matter and not choking and not expelling matter. But that I have to tell you, it's really early in the morning here and the choking and the burping and the eating. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't cope right now, can you, Carol? <laughs> Come on, Carol. We, we've, no, been friends, we've been friends for a long time. You know this is my. That's just the I know it's fabulous, actually. It's it's very interesting, and um, I'm going to have to ring off in a second and then finish your thought. But yeah, I think you're on the track of what I was going to ask: is if there is a signature. I mean, you don't want to wait 600 years, so the signature yep. in a shorter period of time where you can say, "Aha." This is, this is now one of these. Yeah, so uh, probably the, what we call the slow novae, where you have a lot of mass ejected, maybe even 10 to the minus three solar masses, so one part in a thousand of the system is lost, and then the stars separate by a lot, and then after three centuries, once the white dwarf cools down, it stops irradiating its companion, that's where we think the mass transfer rate is probably going to go down essentially or almost to zero. So we are focusing more on the really old novae that lasted a long time, uh, six months to a year. Uh, and there we have to be careful because there can be some confusion with supernovae, but very few supernovae last as long as a year. So the very slowest old novae, the ones that took about a year to decline, uh, are also the candidates that we should be looking at if we want to ever try and find a deeply hibernating system that is a, su a system in suspended animation. And well, Philip W is asking, can it be turned back on? No question. Uh, it, in fact, it will and it must be turned back on. And the reason is that you lose angular momentum on a time scale of tens of thousands of years from any binary system because the red dwarf has a wind. There's always a little bit of mass being lost from any star just like from our sun, and that wind carries away angular momentum. And in addition, in some cataclysmic binaries that are close enough, there's angular momentum lost by gravitational radiation, by gra gravitational waves. Uh, those two processes bring the stars back together again, and the hands of the <laughs> of the red of the red uh, so the hands of the white dwarf close back down again on the hands of the red dwarf, force the mass transfer rate back up, and so at least in the original hibernation scenario, you have classical nova to dwarf nova to hibernating system, back to dwarf nova, back to nova like variable, back to classical nova, and the cycle starts and repeats over and over and over again, so that a nova undergoes perhaps 100,000 eruptions during its lifetime, cycling back and forth between the egg and the caterpillar and the butterfly 
back to the egg over and over again. I don't think I've ever learned more about Novi than I have here today. This is amazing. Glaxi is commenting, and I have to agree. This is a fantastic guest who is talking and giving info spontaneously. So, yes, I, I agree. Thank you, Galaxia. Um, and Larry Key, so is are you saying that the uh, shells just keep happening? They do. Uh, and if we were sensitive enough and we had large enough fields of you, we might, if we were lucky, see concentric shells. You might see a shell from a Nova explosion a few hundred years ago and then a shell that was a lot larger from uh, a Nova uh, that went off 10,000 years ago. And of course, they would be displaced from each other because the star would have been here when it gave rise to the very large shell and then would have moved down to here when it gave rise to the next shell. So you might see a series of shells, small one here, bigger one here, much bigger one centered here, um, a bit like the Hawaiian Islands, you know, yeah. little island, bigger, bigger, bigger as you move down the chain, just because the hotspot brings up stuff at different rates. Same thing here. So that might be something we could look for. The problem is that after a few thousand years, we think that the shell basically blends with the interstellar medium. It stops. There's no more shock. There's no more crashing of the ejecta into the interstellar medium to heat the interstellar medium. So it might get so faint that no technology can uh, can actually find it. But we won't know till we look a lot. Well, further. what wavelength would they be the brightest in? Infrared or um, because of the heating of the interstellar medium? Or what, what yeah, would you so, look? So, so it turns out that we found the very first one, the shell around Z-CAM, was found by Galax through its far ultraviolet imagery. Really? Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Not so, what you might have expected. It was yeah. really quite a shock uh, when, I, when I found out about it. Uh, and the reason is that the sky is just very dark in the ultraviolet. There aren't many processes that let you radiate radiation from the gas in the interstellar medium. So the background sky is very, very dark. And so if you've got even a little bit of ultraviolet radiation radiated by a nova shell or something else, it stands out like a beacon. Would the uh, UV capabilities on Hubble help maybe find some more of these? Uh, I'd, I'd love to say yes. Uh, Hubble is, you know, Hubble's been my life for <laughs> since it was launched. You know, there, there, there it is back there. Uh, I just love this telescope. The only downside with Hubble is that it's got a small field. I see. Okay. Uh, so. And you really need to look over square degrees to find these really, really ginormous shells. And Hubble's not the instrument to do that kind of survey. Okay, well, Alexander Reinders has a, a question that I also have. He's about the binaries themselves. He goes, are the binaries white dwarfs uh, that are, are they, how, are these always, how, I'm trying to, if I read this question exactly, it won't make a lot of sense. Are these binaries white dwarfs, are previously, previous binary stars, or have those dwarfs been captured by the main star? In other words, d are, these binaries, how did they form? Did sure. they did they capture the white dwarf or were, was it always there? No, so a uh, great question actually, and it was an enormous puzzle when these things first were found uh, back in the 1950s. The very first couple of systems. That might be Carol. <laughs> the very first systems uh, that were found were seen to be eclipsing binaries, and people asked the question: Wait a minute. How can this be possible? The two stars are only separated by about the radius of the sun. So you have a red dwarf and a tiny little white dwarf. But that white dwarf must have been a red giant, must have been a hundred times bigger sometime in the past. That's how you make a white dwarf. First, it has to become a red giant. And the realization then came about that as one of the stars becomes a red giant, it swells up and swallows its red dwarf companion. The red dwarf moves around inside the atmosphere of the red giant, releasing a lot of energy because you have a shock wave. It's basically a star moving hypersonically through the atmosphere that blows off most of the atmosphere of the red giant. The core of the red giant, the white dwarf that's left, is then 
brought close to the red dwarf because the red dwarf loses a lot of angular momentum and energy by sweeping away the envelope of the red giant. That's what brings the two stars together. So they initially were a binary separated a hundred times, at least a hundred times further apart than they are today. And then during this very short, what we call a common envelope phase, the two stars were brought really close together. Wow, I'd like to see that. I wonder if there's some images we could get where that, we could actually see that. That would be amazing, seeing a white dwarf inside the, or a, a, uh, when it turns into a red giant, see the other star going around in the atmosphere. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, sounds like Carol's going through customs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that was from Philip W. Uh, yeah, I had to mute you, Carol, just in case you weren't didn't see that. Um, okay. Um, uh, can you also... Oh, Alexander Rangers is wanting to know, can you also read something like the aging of the system out of the shells? Can you tell how old this is? Sure. Um, so when was this system born? Is this the first Nova eruption, the 10th or the 5,000th? Uh, and it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, we don't really know. If I could see all of the shells, you know, if I could count them like tree rings, uh, then I'd have a pretty good idea. But, but you can't. Uh, and so I, I would say today we cannot age date the system. We, we don't have the techniques to do it. Uh, one thing that can help us are theoretical simulations. Uh, because, you know, even though I go to the gym and I eat well, I don't think I'm going to be around in 10,000 years when the system next erupts as a nova. And so in order to try and figure out how these systems evolve, uh, I and colleagues run computer simulations of binaries where the white dwarf accretes matter from the red dwarf, builds up a critical envelope, goes off as a nova, the stars separate, they transfer mass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can simulate not one or two, but we can simulate tens of thousands of these to see how the system ages. So we can start with a whole grid, with a whole slew of white dwarfs and red dwarf masses, and we can see if we can match the characteristics of what we observe with some of the numerical simulations and models to get an idea as to how long this takes and how old the system might be. But in the end, uh, the answer is right now, we honestly don't know. Okay, and, and uh, Larry Keyes is commenting, so this is why we can say that, what well, we can say that we are all the stuff of supernovas. Um, do Not just. Not just. Yeah, that's so, right. I was going to say, I was, this is novas we're talking about. That, so. that is correct. So supernovas make most of the heavy elements, mm -hmm. the iron, the nickel, the cobalt, probably the gold and copper and other heavy elements. Most of the, well, the hydrogen and helium comes from the Big Bang. You don't need stars to make that. The lithium, beryllium, and boron come from the fragmentation of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen by cosmic rays. Uh, most of the nitrogen in the universe, or much of it, probably comes from novas and from wolf rayette stars to some extent, as does some of the aluminum uh, 26 uh, from novas and, and from wolf rayette stars. So there's a variety of different kinds of stars that make the different elements. And uh, the rare Earth elements have been the perhaps the most mysterious of all, uh, the lanthanides, as they're sometimes called, also probably don't come from the supernovas. They probably come from very neutron-rich environments in the universe. Uh, and so there's about half a dozen different sites which give rise to different families of elements in, in the periodic table. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to leave it with this. will be the last question from David Corvin. Uh, uh, since novas are smaller explosions, can mm -hmm. they push planets out of their orbit, thus explaining rogue planets just wandering aimlessly? So let's imagine there's mm -hmm. a binary system with planets in, in orbit yep. around it. Could these yep. nova mm -hmm. perhaps push them out of their orbits? Well, every time a nova goes off, every time a, the, the um, nova eruption happens, you lose a small part of the gravity of the star, you know, of the binary star, say one part in 10,000. So let's say you have a planet orbiting at a fairly large distance. It's or doing its business. It's orbiting around. And then suddenly the source of gravity drops by one part in 10,000. Uh, its orbit is going to expand ever so slightly.
physically bound initially, if it wasn't very, very close into the binary, but it was way, way far out, then when you lose enough mass from the central star, maybe 50% or whatever, you could well unbind the star. That would be a way of losing planets from uh, binary systems. Wow. Okay. Good question. All right. Well, um, I think we will have, well, that's all the time we have right now. I want to thank, I would like to uh, uh, thank my guest, uh, Dr. Michael Shara. He's a curator of astrophysics at the American Museum of Natural History, who has been studying a very ancient Nova system. And I got to say, this was a lot of fun for me. I learned a lot from you today about Novi. So thank you so much, Mike, for taking time out to be on our hangout. Yeah, it was amazing. Absolutely. My, to totally my pleasure, uh, Tony and Carol. Thanks for inviting me. Really enjoyed it. Great. And Carol, I hope you can. Uh, hope you have a safe flight home. I can't wait for you to get home. <laughs> yeah, and and we will uh, talk about your trip because there's some cool stuff you I bet. think you saw out there, isn't there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Lots of stuff. Also, right. take a look at the NASA page, people. Take a <laughs> look at the announcement. Of, the NASA page has an announcement about JWST. Um, I happen to be here with Alberto Conti, our other hangout friend in crime. Oh, Alberto, and, yes. Um, yes, we had a little bit of a panic yesterday. Um, but anyway, the news is out about the JWST launch. So, All right. All right. I'll care. check it out. And I'm, I'm right in the middle of writing a Space Fan News episode. So hopefully I'll include it in, in tomorrow's episode. So thank you, Carol, for letting us okay, know. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, right. Mike, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank so, you, Mike, very much. I appreciate it. Okay, folks. Well, that is okay, it for. Care. All right. Bye bye, Carol. Well, that is it for this week. I want to thank you all for watching. Next, uh, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm working on a Space Fan News episode for tomorrow. Also on uh, next week, we will be back with our last Footsteps to Mars hangout with Dr. Arno, uh, Arnold uh, Nikogosian from uh, from uh, 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 George Mason University. Or, thank you. I drew a blank there. Where we're going to be talking about the sociological implications and the, and the ethical implications of going to Mars. So that'll be next week. Also, uh, ExoLife Hangout comes back next Wednesday. Kevin is currently making our ExoLife uh, description, so I'll have that out uh, in the can on the calendar as soon as I get it done. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks for being great in the comments, guys. I saw what you were doing. I appreciate the moderation. Thank you all so much. See you guys next week. And as always, keep looking up.